data systems. Dr. Rainey has more than 17 years of experience as an IT manager and computing, networking, and storage analyst with various HPC research environments. Prior to joining HDS, he created and led the research markets business segment for Blue Art Corporation. Today, Dr. Rainey visits research computing environments worldwide to help others in the community better design and implement their own solutions. And I actually know Glenn Otero from Dell, and I know him from his UCLA days where he was a customer of ours. <laughs> um, the uh, focus of today's talk, I think really I should uh, explain a little bit more. Uh, Atachi Data Systems, of course, is a storage company, but the part of HDS that I represent is actually the file system portion of the solution. So yes, of course, it sells hardware, uh, but the intellectual property that I'm speaking about and I wanted to talk about today is really more of a file system basis and I wanted to give sort of a comparison or just, um, I don't know, a review maybe is a better term, of um, file systems for research computing with an eye towards perhaps what is coming in the future. Um, I took the, the title sort of tongue in cheek, but I really do think that in HPC environments anyway, we've been doing what's been called big data for quite a long time. Uh, certainly what uh, the commercial entities would consider big data has been, no, well, I think, well known in research markets for quite a while. Uh, but the term big data seems to be getting a lot of marketing these days. So let's dig into that a little bit. Um, there we go. I recently celebrated my 44th birthday, so it gave me a little bit of an opportunity to think back in time to what was going on in research computing over, say, the last 15 years. And what we've seen in terms of evolution of file systems used in research computing in that time frame. Um, the quote from Eric Schmidt at Google there is, uh, I think, probably old even as uh, we speak, but it's still appropriate. Every two days, the Google, probably mostly it's the uh, YouTube portion of their business, creates as much data or as much information every two days as they did from the beginning of their company to 2003. They're probably doing it every couple of hours now. <laughs> anyway, if you're old enough like me to remember about, well, what things were like in research computing 15, say, years ago or even longer, you certainly can remember um, what was considered big data then, uh, and I would say today, just like the, the Dell presentation, um, what was considered big data, say, 15 years ago would be, I don't know, rudimentary today or, or a trivial problem to solve. A lot of that is because, yes, the hard drives have increased in size, and there's something to be said for that. So a petabyte, for example, is much easier to put together uh, than it was 15 years ago simply because the drives are larger. But just because the drives got larger doesn't mean they got any faster, and nor have the file systems necessarily improved. And that, uh, again, is the focus here. Um, I think I will say that the pr problem big data analysis in research computing now has gotten so big, or at least what we see coming on the horizon, uh, the, the, it's not just an order of magnitude or a few orders of magnitude. It's so big now that a single file system solution is probably not ever going to be the answer moving forward. The days of uh, I'm going to get my several petabytes of whatever data and manage it as a single file system, probably not going to happen any longer. What you're going to see is a family of products, each uh, particularly uh, good at some piece of the solution. The data is literally too large to move anymore. You can't just replicate the data from point A to point B and uh, get your data from a file system that's good at, say, scratch space and large sequential bandwidth into another file system that's more appropriate for, I don't know, say, data protection duties or something like that for home directories and replication, and then off to some kind of archival file system, which is um, really architected more for cost per terabyte. Um, the days of moving your data between those file systems is probably over, too. You now have to move the file system to the data instead of moving the data around. And that's really just, a, um, just because the data has gotten too big to handle. It, it literally takes too much time to move from one to the other. So I wanted to draw a comparison here. Um, there is a, a, a study, rather, by CSC that is citing something like a 4,000% increase in annual, annu annualized data generation by the year 2020. So what's coming in the next, uh, we'll call it 15 years, what's coming in the next uh, 15 years compared to what's gone before in the previous 15? Um, the predicted data volume worldwide, 35 zettabytes. That's um, 35 billion terabytes of data worldwide. That's quite a large amount of data. But interesting enough is not so much the size itself, but who's generating all of the data? Okay, 70% um, of the digital universe, they say by 2020, will be generated by individuals. People like me uploading my photos or what have you, or probably by then it'll be real-time holographic video 
<laughs> up into what's increasingly be called geo-social media sites. And this, this is a cool graphic that I stole from um, somebody's webpage here that shows that, um, uh, I think this is as of 2011, 5.3 billion mobile devices worldwide. And you can sort of see some of the people in the geosocial or some of the vendors in the geosocial universe. Facebook, over here, I think I read recently Facebook has recently celebrated its one billionth um, user or customer or what have you. So that's certainly increased since this graphic was created. So there are now a billion users of Facebook, and I don't know what Skype is up to now, but it's probably somewhere up there. And I have accounts probably on most of these. I have a Hotmail account, I have a Gmail account, I use Skype, Facebook, whatever. Although I would say my total digital uh, content creation is, is not anywhere near, um, well, any fraction of a zettabyte, certainly. So I don't know if this prediction is necessarily true, but if it is, it certainly um, makes you think, how does this compare to, say, what is called big data in research computing, which is sort of the whole idea. Oh, of that 70% of the total digital universe that's created by individuals, none of that is curated and hosted and maintained necessarily by the individuals. I still have to use a company like Facebook or Skype or whatever. To, I have to count on them to manage all of this data that I'm creating. Right? I don't host it on my own web server. I use their web server. So I may be the author of the content, but I'm certainly not the uh, IT person responsible for, for keeping that stuff running, and therefore not really interested in the file systems that are being used. Here is uh, another chart um, I took sort of uh, from a blog posting there from Gary Johnson there. Um, and this is sort of to give you an idea how some of the uh, stuff like Facebook, for example, and an impressive 180 petabytes of content per year, which is quite a lot of data, but how it compares to some of the really big, big data projects uh, in, in research. And here in Australia, of course, the Square Kilometer Array uh, is probably going to be the single largest uh, experiment that generates uh, volumes of data. Now, all of the data won't actually be kept, but even the processed data, not the raw data streaming from the telescopes, but the, even the processed data, they're, they're thinking it's going to be in the exabyte range. So um, Square Kilometer, Kilometer Array is not yet online, but it's probably, uh, it's in the very uh, near time frame, certainly before 2020. So three exabytes a year is, is um, well, it's quite a bit more than uh, something like a Facebook, for example, and that's just a single uh, research experiment. Something like uh, the Large Hadron Collider, which uh, was also referenced in the Dell talk there, 15 petabytes a year of process data that they keep. They also don't keep a lot of the raw event data, but even the process data, 15 petabytes a year. Um, or if you look at the medical imaging up there, that's really just radiology. But worldwide, that's you know an exabyte a year. So all of these things are not uh, generated by individuals, and this is why when I look at uh, charts like this and think about the amount of data being generated in research computing worldwide, I do think it is still a very significant fraction of the total data generated uh, on this planet. And certainly, um, while the geo-social media stuff is important, research computing will still need to be uh, considered very carefully. And more importantly, the file systems that are being used for research computing is what I'm keenly interested in. Um, this graphic here, I think, goes to um, show, you know, in very simple terms, uh, what you find in research computing. You have this thing, some device, you know, it could be a large hadron collider or something that generates a bunch of data. It could be a DNA sequence or what have you. And then you need to get that data onto some kind of computational resource. I need to put it someplace that uh, usually a Linux cluster can operate on so that I can do my analysis. And then I then have to move the data downstream to long-term archive, assuming that I want to keep the data that's important and valuable. Uh, and then all the time, whether it's the raw data being generated from the instruments or it's the computational data or it's even long-term archive data that I'm now recalling, I've got to give researchers access to it. And depending on the research project, it could be worldwide collaboration, especially in commercial research where you have, say, large pharmaceutical company where you have multiple organizations in multiple countries all needing access to the same data. So ubiquity of access is important, and I would count at least three different classes of file system here. Something to stream the data off, something to, to use with a computational resource, and then an archival sort of file system. And it's very difficult at these kinds of scales that we're talking about that's coming in the near future to, uh, to think about a single file system that does this. Um, at BlueArc, and now at HDS, this is an old BlueArc slide which I made, I don't know, 10 years ago. Um, We've made a, quite a good business in research computing doing what I would call essentially project space, home directories, maybe even archive space uh, for lots of different research universities in a variety of research disciplines. 
So um, and now with the HDS presence, the Hitachi Data Systems presence, I would say it's you know many hundreds of uh, research uh, research groups worldwide use our products, and that's with just I would say regular NAS based storage, nothing complicated. It looks like a big NFS server, right? Very simple. But what's coming in the future? Much much different. What we have now at HDS here sort of is this, this graphic here with the Hitachi NAS platform, the, the intellectual property that came from the Blue Arc acquisition. That is your uh, NAS access or your active data. I need to get to my data quickly. And then we have this Hitachi content platform, or HCP, on the back end, uh, which is, I think, a much better file system for uh, indexing, searching, long-term archive, uh, data curation uh, that you wouldn't necessarily associate with NAS. It's more of an object store. Uh, and we've really blended these two together, and we do this intelligent tiering and movement of data so that it all looks like a single file system view back to the hosts. So from the customer's perspective, oh yeah, we also have some Hitachi Data Discovery Suite to help you search and find things in your data store, and this Hitachi Data Ingester product as well to help um, load data into the uh, file system. But what the end user sees is, uh, if, if you're a Linux user, all you see is a single NFS export, global namespace. It looks like one gigantic, you know, multi-petabyte, if you want it to be, uh, NFS mount. So very simple, uses standard protocols. You don't need any proprietary file system, anything. The access is using standard open protocols like NFS or SIFS if you're a Windows user, or increasingly HTTP, SOAP uh, API. Okay, so this is what we offer today. What's coming in the future, though, is more of this analysis. This is where we are, I think, in this graphic. If you haven't seen this before, this is a sort of the evolution from data generation to actual knowledge and wisdom. Uh, I think we're sort of still on the left-hand side or maybe in the middle of this. We definitely have the, um, please clean filter. <laughs> we definitely have the ability to generate huge volumes of data. That is definitely not in doubt. Actually analyzing the volumes of data and, and getting some intelligence out of there and figuring out the trends in, in petabytes or exabytes of data we're still, I think, in the very beginning stages of this. File systems like Hadoop, for example, that were created to solve these big data analysis challenges um, are really still in their infancy. And we're certainly not yet at the, uh, at the wisdom level where you're actually bringing that down to a, a personal level. And that's what's coming in the future. We need to get, um, we need to use the foundation of our, our file system enterprise, Silicon FS, the uh, hardware. If you don't know, remember anything else about Blue Arc or Hitachi NAS, just remember, the file system is implemented in hardware. That's how we're so much faster and more scalable than the other guys. We're not using PCs. With all due respect to Dell, we're not buying Dell servers and installing software on top of it. It is a hardware device, um, largely implemented in FPGAs. Um, so it looks like an NFS server, but it operates at a much larger speed. The, the challenge, I think, for us as a company going forward is to use this uh, Silicon FS-based system and add in analysis-based tools this Hadoop-like functionality at uh, preferably exascales or at least petascales. That, I think, is the next challenge for us. We already can do the traditional NAS stuff. We can already do the object-based storage stuff. We can already scale to several tens of petabytes anyway. But for, for the real next step to offer, uh, to get us to that wisdom and knowledge, I think we really need the analysis phase. I um, don't have much time left here, so let me skip through some of this um, here. Is this a build-up slide? Yes. Look at that, how clever. We already uh, have this capability of using Hitachi NAS. It is a clustered file system, by the way. You can certainly have more than one server. So we already have this clustered file system space here where it looks like a giant NFS server with the global main space. We can already uh, intelligently and transparently migrate the data downstream even to third-party devices. I hope we use that app in this picture here. I hope nobody here has from that app. I don't, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Are you? Okay, I don't know of any other vendor that does this. NetApp certainly will not sell me something that allows me to use HDS NAS as part of my solution. I don't think any other vendor will do that, but we do. We'll give you the single file system view, and you can migrate your data off to NetApp if you want to, or any other third-party device. Um, and certainly, uh, HCP is another one of those devices that we can migrate data off to. So we maintain the single file system review. We maintain curation of the metadata. But this sort of, uh, you know, whatever's down here, doesn't matter to us. Just blocks a disk somewhere. Content-aware data movement, all of those uh, nice policy engines, like, for example, 
I can create a policy that says move all PDFs older than 90 days or that haven't been accessed in more than 90 days and are therefore cold, cold PDFs. Move that off to my, uh, or all the ones that contain the word budget, move that off to my HCP and create a, a, a resting place for it. Now I can run this policy over and over to try to get the, all of my data curated in that way. Um, if you're not familiar with Tachi Content Platform, it's available either as an appliance or basically as a gateway to a backend SAM. The HNAS architecture is similar. It uses uh, blocks of storage on a backend SAM. Okay, so it's not a uh, it's not a JBOD or SBOD type of uh, architecture. How big can you build a SAM? I guess it depends how how many lungs you can put together. <laughs> it can be quite quite large. Um, the Itachi Content Platform, again, this, this ubiquity of access here. This platform already uses NFS or SIS for the Windows Cloud. Yes, you can't use SMTP. I don't know a lot of people that would do that, but if you were some kind of email service provider, you might be interested in this kind of access. And increasingly, it's the web-based protocols that are now being used. So the idea is to use standards-based protocols. Don't change your protocol at all. Don't use a proprietary file system client piece of software to access your data at petascale and at speeds that are traditionally not associated with standard NFS servers. Most people in research computing think of NFS as slow. Not to pick on NetApp, but that's, you know, you did invent the whole NAS industry, so. <laughs> so, um, most of the time, you'll think, hey, I need a, a par usually a parallel file system, like Luster, for example, in order to get, say, several gigabytes a second of access. Right? What if you could get Luster-like performance with real metadata failover <laughs> and use standard protocols like NFS? No more proprietary client software, no more kernel revisions, no more making sure that this is compatible with whatever kernel I'm running on my cluster. Just use NFS. And then if my researchers want to get to my data, well, guess what? It's NFS. They can just run it on their laptop. You know, they don't have to learn any special software. Here's another feature we already have today. Is this another build-up slide? I think it is, yeah. The idea of using replication is certainly not new, uh, not part, or not uh, something that we have that other ones uh, don't. But the idea of using replication as a DR, a solution also, is something that's a little bit different. So we call it, um, uh, the HDS term is jet mirror. And the idea is to move uh, the data, blocks of data from a source to a target, just like any other replication schema. Although it is object-based, so you don't have to crawl through the file system to find all the, all the pieces that need to be replicated because you can scan the object store in hardware at hardware speeds to figure out what you need to move in the first place. So there's no more crawling the file system, which is especially important if you're trying to replicate petabyte uh, data. How much of that petabyte has changed since last Tuesday, since the last time I ran replication? You know, there could be 20 billion objects in, that, uh, in a petabyte of data. It will take forever to walk through that file system uh, using normal replication methods. Not only are you uh, replicating the data, though, you also replicate the access points, or in this case, NFS exports or SIF shares. So it's, it's, it's um, I won't say it's trivial, but it's easy for us to use the replicated copy and really turn that around quickly and make that the primary file system. So if you have several sites and they each have the same data, you can replicate from site A to site B or site C or what have you, and without too much trouble, make any of them the active file system. Okay, so obviously important in a DR scenario, but also pretty very important for collaborative research, right? All right, also something we offer today. Now, um, I only have a few minutes left here, so I wanted to just throw these up real quickly. This is from one of our performance white papers, but this is what you can get with an Atachi NAS-based solution today, right out of the box. This is a single server, single server, um, not a clustered machine, no, nothing, just one server. And you can see for yourself the parameters up there. So 1.4 gigabytes a second, something like that, depending on what you're doing. With, uh, I would say, not, no, not, no, no um, special high-performance disk here, no SSDs, no nothing. This is cheap, 2 terabyte, 7200 RPM disk, and nothing else. Now, if you give me some more budget and you give me some SSDs, okay, I can probably go even faster. But still, you can get uh, 1.4 gigabytes a second over standard NFS per node. So if I cluster more of these together, I could get, say, a 5 gigabyte per second system pretty easily. 5 gigabytes per second is probably good enough for most of those people who think they need luster for a high-performance scratch tier. 
right? So I get all these cool enterprise features, I get all the replication, I get all the nice failover, all the stuff that makes storage administrators happy, and I can still do five gigabytes a second over plain old NFS. Can't make everybody happy there. You still need Luster for the top 10 or 20 of the top 500. Fine. <laughs> That's still Luster. It's still fine there. You don't need parallel file systems there. Come back and talk to me when PNFS is more of a accepted standard, and then we can talk more about why you might want to use uh, PNFS instead of, say, Luster. Uh, on an IOPS basis, if you're not really concerned about sequential bandwidth, but you're more caring about transactions per second, and there are some research workflows, uh, bioinformatics, for example, where this is more important. We are still, to this day, the single fastest per node IOPS uh, leader without resorting to use of S uh, SSDs or some kind of caching uh, appliance. And this is, again, it's all with, uh, with straight disk. Um, there are some, uh, uh, this is a spec SFS benchmark if you're not familiar with it. Uh, and it's all open. You can go up there and read and see what everybody's used for their architectures. But anyone who's posted a higher number than that has either used a lot more servers, I think in NetApp's case it was 24 servers, or they're using some kind of SSD to accelerate uh, the operations, which we can do too, but it's kind of like cheating. Okay, so last slide. I just wanted to uh, leave you with the concepts that I've described in our file system, talk about some of that analysis stuff that's coming up in the future to uh, sort of get, uh, get people prepared for petascale or even exascale research computing type projects, that kind of stuff you can get in your file system. And now think back over the last, say, 15 years and the file systems that we've seen in research computing in that time frame. I don't think there's any other file system that's better prepared to take on this petascale or exascale type challenge. Right. You've got these kinds of file systems in existence today, but the, uh, the Hitachi file system that we have, it has a distributed file system look. It looks like a giant NFS server, uses standard client software. It is a shared SAN type of architecture because it does use real SAN as a back end. Unlike, say, Panassas, for example, there's no real SAN on the back end there. It's all local, local disk. Um, and it is highly parallelized. We can give you most of the performance of the parallel file systems, but yet you still get those enterprise features, which is sort of the po whole point of this slide, is to get you thinking about where does the HDS file system fit. It's really a blend of all three file system types. So I'll just leave it there. And um, if you're thinking about or you're involved with exascale or petascale type uh, file system challenges, and then we'd certainly like to talk to you about what we can do versus the competition. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, James. Any questions for James? No, in that case.